Hey there, and welcome to the Pseudo Show, brought to you by the Destination Linux Network. Today ends a two-part arc centered around DevOps. Today, I bring on my friend Neil Gampa again to unpack the operations side of the methodology. Hey there, and welcome to the Pseudo Show, where business meets open source. I'm Brandon, and this week, Neil Gampa joins me again to dive into the operations side of DevOps. For those who don't know Neil, Neil is known in the Destination Linux community as an open source advocate, Fedora CentOS Stream, and OpenSUSE contributor, and that's just his hobby. Neil is also a senior DevOps engineer at Datto. Datto is a leader in MSP solutions, including network and backup. This episode of the Pseudo Show is brought to you by DigitalOcean. Head on over to do.co slash tux2022 to get started with a $100 credit. DigitalOcean has a comprehensive portfolio of compute, storage, database, and networking products that put your cloud infrastructure in capable hands so you and your teams can get back to doing what matters most, building world-changing apps that grow your business. Predictable pricing, robust product docs, and services that developers love get support at every stage of growth with simple, powerful comp cloud computing. Get growing at DigitalOcean. As a listener of the Pseudo Show and a member of the DLN community, you can get started for free. In fact, it's better than free because DigitalOcean is giving you a $100 credit when you sign up at do.co slash tux2022. We want to thank DigitalOcean for sponsoring this episode of The Pseudo Show. Today's episode is brought to you by Bitwarden. Bitwarden is the easiest and safest way for individuals, teams, and business organizations to store, share, and sync sensitive data. Bitwarden is an open source password management tool whose feature set rivals any other tool on the market today. Not only is Bitwarden open source, it is regularly audited by third party security professionals. You can get started for free at bitwarden.com slash DLN and plans start at just $10 per year. Thank you to Bitwarden for sponsoring the pseudo show and the entire Destination Linux network. Hey, Neil, thanks for joining me again. I really appreciate you jumping back on. Hey, Brandon, it's so great to come back again. I love hanging out with you and talking about all kinds of stuff, including what we're going to talk about today. I actually was uh, joking that we should record our pre-shows. <laughs> I obviously didn't do it this time because like, I got pulled off one direction and you got phone calls. So like, it just didn't make sense to record it this time, but... I just am like, one day I'm just going to record one of our conversations and just publish it. <laughs> well, maybe. I mean, we could also do like some kind of fun panel thing or whatever. Like there's a ton of options with pseudo labs and all that other fun stuff. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So I, I'm uh, going to think of something. We'll, we'll figure it out. Yeah, uh, this is just our continuation of our conversation from the last episode. You know, in the last episode, we really unpacked the dev side of DevOps. Definitely did get some into the op side of of the equation i was actually debating if we even needed a second episode yeah i decided needed to unpack this a bit more i've explored this in the past with eric and i want to get another take on this one of the big things about devops that i think is really interesting is the evolution of the role of the system administrator thanks to devops and let, let's unpack that a bit. So in terms of the operations side, what's the operations team team's goals? And it's keep things up, make sure everything's stable, nothing goes down. That's contrary to development. Usually developers want to move really quick. They want air, they want to break things. And sometimes when they do deploy for a new code, it does break things, but it you know, thankfully they're with as we explained in the last episode, there's gates in place to prevent bad code from going out. So it doesn't break your applications, which lowers your downtime. You know, covering the telco industry, 
five nine uptime is is an absolute must. So CI is very important in in my line of work. Five nines is hard. Five nines kind of hurts. I have uh, sort of kind of functionally adjacent been in that space, and uh, five nines is hard. And and the kind of work you have to do with even in pre DevOps, pulling that kind of stuff off is frankly a miracle, right? It's it's really, really difficult and it involves a lot of extra work that it's nice to see that kind of starting to be built into the development and operational philosophy of applications with the DevOps culture type thing going on. And I want to put something into perspective here with uh with the audience. If you're not familiar with how downtime is when downtime is measured, it's always measured in minutes. Five nine uptime is ninety nine point nine 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 percent uptime, which means only six minutes of downtime a year in a three hundred and sixty five. So six minutes. So by the time I finish my morning coffee, if there's an outage, that's you've blown the error budget. You're, you're now basically down to four nine uptime. Just uh, put that into perspective. It, it's a very very compact in terms of uh, what downtime is allowed. Yeah, especially toasting in the telco space. My, toasting my bagels blows out the error budget for the Exactly. Year. Yep. So you know, one of the things that I've been definitely been thinking about a lot is how ops can work with development better. I mean, even with DevOps philosophy, in many shops I work with, I don't know how it how it works, where you where you work, Neil, or other places that you've uh, seen it. But it. You know, there's still like that clash, even though there's still that CI pipeline that shows, yep, everything's green. Ops still is like you're still throwing co- code over the fence, and I get to own the pieces. I think one of the things that that's helped a lot is the evolution of the ops role, whether if that's called a system administrator, even in some cases could be even called an SRE or some other title is it's starting to look less and less and less like a traditional system administrator. And it's looking more like a developer. They're writing more code, even if it's, I know some people will say bash is not code, but bash is a scripting language or even YAML. At this point, I think we can start to classify YAML as a programming language since I'm starting to see YAML as a job requirement on many job descriptions, <laughs> even for hardcore development roles. You have made me shudder with those words. <laughs> oh, that was the goal. That was the goal. <laughs> so I think that's kind of helped a lot with bridging that gap. Other than roles starting to look more developer style roles, is there anything else that could be done better? And maybe maybe we unpack like what you you work in a based on what based on these conversations, a pretty uh, progressive company as far as like a DevOps or an automation culture. So how how does that work at Datto? Like what is I know it's pro- probably less like throw code over the fence and hope everything works. So when I started at Datto years ago, so I started at Datto, I think oh gosh, it's been seven years now. Um, it was a lot more like that, but we were starting on that journey to kind of blend the two roles together. And I think, you know, my team was like one of the f- first or second experiments in this space. Today, the way things kind of work now is you have the SRE types that are essentially the engineers that manage the operational parts within the software teams. Uh, and they work with systems engineers. So we don't have, you know, systems administrators. We have systems engineers. That, that, I think, is a very important distinction because it, it, it tilts the focus from keeping the systems alive to having the systems keep themselves alive. And so a lot of the work is done around engineering solutions to automate things, to assemble platforms that can service each other and service themselves. And you basically build this, this model I don't necessarily want to say it's all like full self-service because there's certainly gates and there's there's responsibilities that have to be managed mm-hmm. there and things like that. But you start seeing things will look a lot more like a, a shared responsibility model between the uh, infrastructure teams that have systems engineers and the software teams, which have site uh, systems reliability engineers. And and then you have the DevOps people that kind of cross those those two realms. 
I think that actually works out really well because it gives an opportunity for specialization. So one of the things that I tend to see as a flaw in, in classic uh, models for IT is that you have software developers developing the solutions based on their ideal modeling in their in their heads or their design docs or whatever. And then when it's being transferred over to operations, um, the ideal hits reality. And there's a lot of retrofitting and a lot of churning around and, 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 and restructuring or bending things. But that feedback loop doesn't come back to the developers to adjust their model. So because the expertise doesn't flow in both directions. I think that's kind of where, where, where it starts mattering is that these, these systems engineers work with the software engineers and the site SREs and make it so that you see uh, the knowledge coming from the software developers to the infrastructure people to iterate and design a solution that actually works to solve the problem. And, and this continuous iteration and automation and maintenance and that sort of thing makes it so that you will have a hopefully better outcome. Uh, and, and I think that really is, that's what I see a lot of at Datto where you have these this model of partnership and, and continuous improvement and strong feedback loops to make it so that the teams are working together towards a goal. We have a, um, we have a, a value inside of Datto called we are one team. And, and I think that's, that's like a big part of it is making sure that we are all aligning ourselves and we are all working together to make everyone successful. I really like that. We are one team. I, that that's really cool. Everyone has ownership of what goes wrong. It's it's not just on one team or one singular person. I like that. I love it too. Like I like this idea because I've seen where it's not like that and things eventually crumble. It takes it may take a while, but it eventually crumbles. So this idea of making it so everyone feels some ownership, some stake in it and feels some modicum of success when it is successful, when a project is successful. I think I think that leads to better outcomes in terms of that feedback loop getting the information back to the developers especially around security developer is not aware that was not a good idea to do what they just did whatever that was like it's just not best practices for deploying code into a production environment that's getting millions of hits a day it's just getting that feedback into dev produces better code and also makes things easier for ops who then doesn't have to figure out a workaround to make sure that what was just deployed doesn't get exploited. Yeah. Well, as I said before uh, in a previous episode that we talked about how, you know, your deployment and your operational strategy is a reflection of the development complexity and you should aim for simpler to, to kind of make things better for everyone. You know, there's a corollary as system systems naturally have a tendency towards getting more complicated as more requirements come in, as needs change, as things evolve, that just sort of happens. Having everyone involved during that process as the systems themselves evolve, I think makes it so that that kind of, that kind of churn, that kind of evolution, that type of, that kind of like increase in complexity is manageable. One of the big things that I think that does help with increased in, increase in complexity in systems is taking our infrastructure designs and getting them down into, I'm going to use the buzzword infrastructure as code, you know, getting them into Git. How could you, Brandon? How could you? Actually, it's coming up uh, in uh, the next episode. Oh, hold on. I got to, now I got to look it up now. Uh, so in the, ne in the upcoming episode, I it's, will either be the next episode or the following. I have an interview with the founder of Cycloid. And mm. what's really cool, and I think this would be a huge help to developers, not just developers, to ops, mostly in the ops side, to get a grasp on what you actually have currently deployed. And they have a tool called Terra Cognata, uh, 
Terracognita. Terracognita. And Terracognita, what Terracognita does is it will go out to a cloud provider, let's say AWS or GCP. Eventually, they'll be able to do OpenStack and others. What's really, really neat is it will scan it and then spit out Terraform configuration. I think that's really neat. Then you can be able to redeploy your infrastructure quickly if needed. When I came across this, I'm like, I got to get these guys on the, the pod. That sounds very interesting to me. I, per- I I personally fancy using Ansible for cloud deployments, but it's actually the nature of Terraform as a tool. And I, I kind of don't want to focus too hard on tools, but like the nature of Terraform as a tool, since we're talking about it, you know, it makes it super easy for someone to, you know, do such a, an a- analysis, turn around and, and, and pull out like, what are the instances you're doing? What are the AMIs you're using? What's the key setup? What's the VPCs? Like some of the basic stuff and turn it into something that you could then introspect again and, and adapt it for whatever automation of choice it is. Like even if you have it as Terraform HCL, which I think, yeah, Terraform HCL, right? Like then you can turn around and introspect that again as declarative data and turn it into something more useful like Ansible provisioning stuff or even keep it as Terraform and augment it with Ansible or or use a Foreman instance to do life cycling and, and, and stuff like that. There's, there's a lot of interesting uh, opportunities there to be able to take something that wasn't originally automated and be able to bootstrap a whole new method of automating all the things. Only reason why I brought it up is because we're talking about infrastructure as code in this part of the show. And I know a lot of shops that just went out and deployed things manually. And now they're trying to figure out, we need to bring this back in and put it into our new processes around GitOps slash infrastructure's code. So everything's in Git. And I was something like this, a tool like this, I, I, yeah, I didn't want to focus a lot on tools either. It's uh, just something that can help handle the uh, those brownfield environments. Because not right. everything's greenfield. Almost nothing is greenfield. I, I'm I'm going to have a, a, this is a ringing disappointment for a lot of people out there. I think in my entire career, I've encountered twice where I got to do greenfield. Everything else is brownfield or worse. And you kind of don't want to know what worse is. That That's kind of the reality as working with with these things, especially if you're going into a, into an operation that isn't doing this already and they really want to. It's, it's a really hard transformation to pull off and it takes a lot of guts and it takes a huge mindset shift and it also takes a ton of buy-in and most importantly, it takes a lot of time. That's the part that most companies can't stomach and it's something that just bites them over and over again. And I think this is actually why we hear so much about these quote-unquote DevOps tools because people really, really don't like the fact that it takes time. I'll, I'll take Brownfield to a whole new level. <laughs> I imagine you would be able to. All I got to say is still in production, still running critical work for this customer. HP Superdome system that went end of life in 2006. Wait a minute. Hold up. Isn't isn't the Superdome, isn't that an Itanic system? Yes, it is. Oh, no. Okay. For all the audience reference, Itanic is the name that a lot of us in the industry who had to work with these unfortunate things, uh, we refer to the Intel Itanium architecture by this name because uh, uh, Intel promised it to be the best in the world and it would replace all others and it would be the uh, the, the thing to end all the all processor architectures. And it hit its own iceberg and then just stalled out like within a few years of its mass market release. If you see references to IA64, that's Titanic. Yep. So my point is, with Brownfield, going back to the real conversation here, there's stuff from everywhere. Shun uh, shun what's Brownfield, because I've seen even shops are like, oh, that that's stuff they have over here. That, that's just old and crusty, even if it's just from two, three years ago, people come in and just try to clean it out. Like, no, you can't just do that. It's so, still making money. That that 
uh, as I put, as I call it, uh, revenue generating systems. Mm-hmm. Like in many cases, these these uh, systems are essentially printing money for the company. You know, people ask me, or or they look at me incredulously when when I mention that um, COBOL and AS four hundred systems rule the roost for a lot of the bigger and older industries, a lot of the early adopters of computers. And, you know, if you really, and and those are the machines that buy mainframes and they scoff at me and say, oh, mainframes, those things, why? They're just, they're old and busted. It's like, no, they're, they're, they're actually very good at the problems that they solve. And the thing about mainframes is that they wouldn't exist if they weren't useful because they are incredibly expensive to keep up with. If they are if they are doing well in a particular market vertical, they're going to keep using it. Actually, kind of taking that to the uh into the topic. Mainframes are complex, very complex systems. Oh jeez. Yeah. You need op- operations people that understand it. Developers aren't going to care. But actually what's really cool today if uh, companies that do run mainframes and that uh, they have applications that can utilize the power and the instruction set of the mainframe and almost every language these days is interpreted so it doesn't even matter like python etc so as long as the, uh, the ops person can do it and and maintain it and understand it uh, you can have your entire business essentially run on them I'm not, I don't want to sound like I'm selling an IBM mainframe, but anyway. No. So, like, so I have absolutely nothing to do with IBM mainframes. And I will say right now, an IBM mainframe is not a blocker to doing DevOps. It is, it is actually a very, if you have one and it is working well for you, the only thing I would say is just pivot it to running Linux. And then you can start taking advantage of the skills and the people that are in there in that space to really implement these kinds of um, things, because the only real downside to mainframes, and actually I think this is a similar downside to um, what is it? I think they're called IBM I now, like uh, the, 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 uh, the power series, the, the P series and the I series power systems. The only other, the only downside to Z, which is the, the, the branding for, for mainframes now and I and, and P is that their default is not Linux you need to request that you have your models use Linux. And if you have something like Red Hat Enterprise Linux on there or SUSE Linux Enterprise, you can take advantage of the tooling and the ecosystem and the work that has gone into those spaces to actually do use these, uh, these tools of the trade. Like there's, none of these things are out of reach for you if you're using mainframes it's it's really you just have to be a little bit more creative make sure you're on the right platform base get the get people who are familiar with it and just start doing it like in in devops or really in engineering as a whole it's really about making create uh, solving problems creatively within the bounds that you have within the constraints that you have so like maybe you are looking at um maybe you're looking at uh, doing uh, a lift and shift into the cloud, or maybe you're looking at a lift and shift into an enterprise Linux platform from, from maybe you were running, I don't know, like maybe some Debian or, or old CentOS or whatever, and you want to move into say RHEL or, or SLE. Being able to pull off those kinds of things requires the, the people, the culture, and the desire to pull these things off and then just be willing to accept the time that it takes to do it. All of this is achievable. All of this is affordable. Uh, it's just, you gotta, it, you, you just have to be set up mentally and, uh, and, and and set expectations, set the timelines and just iterate on it. Uh, like you can, you can go from a bad si- situation to a good one in any corporate environment if you really, really want to. But then this comes back to like, you need to have this whole understanding of the business you know, being able to interface with business types, working with different stakeholders like communication, politics, internal business politics, understanding how the company makes money, relating problems, solutions that you're offering to the problems that the business has and the way that it can affect them and to their benefit. 
or detriment, depending on what you're trying to do. Those are the sorts of things like you just, and it just goes back to, it's all about people. It's all about figuring out, you know, how you want to have your people involved. I just, uh, you know, talking about the brownfield, it, it's just going to be there and the investments and the applications that are there are not going away. Bringing those applications into a DevOps world, as Neil said, isn't a huge shift because it's not a tools problem. You can do all of it because you can run every tool that can be ran on a mainframe, on a power system. Kubernetes runs on power and mainframe. Mm -hmm. So if you classify those as DevOps tools, guess what? You just did DevOps on, <laughs> on, on a mainframe. A, I mean, frames. I think it's it's important to uh, you know I'm going to reiterate this and I've said it already earlier, but I'll say it again because I think it's really important. All engineering is is cr having creative solutions to creative problems. Sometimes it goes a little too far, but sometimes it's just right, and sometimes it might not be enough, and you just have to go back and and take a look at it, step back and look forward at it again. I think this is why you tend to see people talking about GitOps and infrastructure as code, which, you know, Brandon, this, those terms feel weird to me. I feel like they're just two sides of the same coin. Like when I think about GitOps and infrastructure as code, I feel like GitOps is the thought process around it and infrastructure and like the philosophy and, and the people side of it. And then infrastructure as code is really the implementation detail about it. Like you're, you're, cause like you, you're, you're basically saying that GitOps is or really version ops, like what, or, or, or whatever you want to call it. When you do Git ops, it doesn't necessarily imply that you have code for it, but infrastructure as code is an implementation model for Git ops. And that's how I kind of think of it. What do you think about it? Well, Git ops, you don't even need, like you said, you don't even need code. Like it could be it, in some cases with Git ops, it could just be architecture diagrams, something mm -hmm. silly like that, uh, just version controlled and, and, and tracked. And then you can throw in the, you add in the infrastructure as code, like what people think of as infrastructure as code, your Ansible playbooks, your Terraform into that same philosophy. So that's your, your bash scripts, even your legacy ones, any legacy code that runs infrastructure. I think I will, I think I'll make a point here to say that it, it, if it's something that's running your infrastructure and is running it today and it is working, it's not legacy. That's true. No, you're right. No, absolutely. Because like I hear people throw around the word like sometimes I wonder, and this is this is a peeve of mine. People throw around the words deprecated and legacy without understanding what those words mean. And like somebody will say, oh, this thing is deprecated. So uh, so everything is going to break. And it's like, are you sure that's what deprecated means? Because deprecated means someone has marked it as being no longer being maintained and you should probably do something about it. It doesn't mean that it is gone right now. And it's a peeve of mine that people use deprecated to mean removed because it sends a completely different message and it's very confusing. So likewise, with legacy, legacy implies it's a system that's being phased out. In most cases, the stuff you're describing as legacy is probably never going to go anywhere, right? So like those scripts aren't going anywhere. Those bash scripts are probably fine. You know what's probably going to happen? And I'll tell you right now because I've seen it enough times. Those bash scripts, those Python scripts that you wrote ad hoc are going to just get strapped right onto your Ansible because you know what? That's fine. Usually when pe when people refer to legacy it just means it's just been around forever. It's not yeah. a new system. And that's typically when I say legacy, I mean, it's an existing system. It's been around it as existing processes. For me, it's getting all those processes in to get especially the monitoring. I actually think monitoring is one of the easiest things to do infrastructure as code with. Like one thing, so something super simple, right? A lot of older applications, I refuse to use the word legacy here, but a lot of older applications, they do things like write out log files to disk or write to syslog. Well, if you're on a, if you uplift those applications in, into a, a modern enterprise Linux distribution that has um, systemd with the systemd journal, right? You can actually, with almost no effort, retool that application to put all of its logs into the journal and then have the journal forward all of its logs into a, a monitoring system. So like, I think one very popular tool out there is a journal beat from Elastic. 
and and that tool lets you take the the um, the information from the systemd journal and forward it on into your your uh, your monitoring stack, whether it's um, people used to call it an elk stack. I think Elastic just calls it the Elastic stack now. But like if you've got a, a, an open search or Elastic search or Victoria metrics or Zabbix or whatever platform you want to choose for doing this sort of thing or Nagios or Asigna or the, the list goes on. But like you can you can take you can take those things and and put them into into those platforms to be able to do monitoring, logging, metrics, analysis, and stuff like that. And with stuff like the Systemd Journal, right? This is a very simple uplift. The Systemd Journal gives you so much more information that you can use to do uh, to do metrics on. Like it'll tell you RAM usage of the process. It'll tell you how long it's been alive, how many restarts have happened with it. You can see like how much CPU resources it's used. You know whether it's like hitting pressure limits, what kinds of and and you can see those kinds of error states and that information, and that's information you didn't have before. Uh, I was thinking something much simpler. I'm glad you brought you, we went into that. I was I was just thinking like your monitoring configs, like if sure. you're like anything that you just anything that's exportable, whether if that's exporting your monitoring configs in Zabbix or. If you use like Sensu, which already does that for you, because it's all right. monitoring config is written in YAML, so it's just kind of expected. <sighs> yeah. Hey, hey, everything's in YAML. I said I, I keep I keep telling you. Hey, the Java world's all in XML, so there's that. Hey, I li- I like XML better. Yeah, I, I I kind of prefer it too. I know that's a very unpopular opinion, but I like my I like my config my my. Um, my declarations to have definitions and and xml tends to have that whereas yaml doesn't you can have it you have to really work at it though for yaml um but like it, another thing is that in a lot of common places you know i, I don't want to get too specific but like with java applications jmx is your friend right it's it, a lot of places are just not taking advantage of the fact that the jvm is made of liquid awesome and has all these things there for you and you can literally drop in a small XML file that configures it so that it exports that information. And you can and you can forward that onto whatever tool of your choice to analyze it. I, I haven't heard anyone use the term awesome and JVM in the same sentence in quite some time, Neil. Hey, I'm still a fan of the JVM. Now the Java ecosystem can go, you know, stuff it. But like the uh the JVM is really cool, and I really do like a lot of the things. And actually, even the Java programming language is, I'm fine with it. Like most of my problems with Java come from the Maven ecosystem, where they're very clearly not in this world. Um, like Maven doesn't require people to upload source artifacts. Um, uh, the way dependencies are handled with Maven just scared the crap out of me. And uh, when you when you get unfortunate things like log4j, you wind up having to do binary patching, which is never fun for anyone involved. And one thing I would personally on my wish list is I would love the Java ecosystem to kind of become more like the Python one, where things Maven artifacts that are uploaded have to include sources. There is an expectation that you can build things from source from the full dependency chain, because then you can verify the integrity of your applications. And like this is a serious problem that the the Java world just I don't think they're thinking about. Like at one point I talked to the like I had a conversation with the Gradle folks some years ago, and they said, "Oh, this is normal and expected that we have to bin download like these exact things, and that gives us our reproducibility." Uh, but reproducibility of what? What if we have to replace a dependency because you know it's vulnerable or whatever? Like, what if we we have to change it because of some X, Y, Z reason? Because that's a very reasonable thing to have happen. How do you how do you fix Gradle then? How do you fix any Java application that has this problem? Like, most of my problems with Java in the ecosystem are not with the... Are, some of it's with the tools. Like, Maven Central's still kind of broken, in my opinion. But... Most of it's actually around how the way people think about their software. And I think, you know what? I, I, I'll, I'll say a stronger statement. I think this is why people really hate Java. 
I think this is really why people keep moving away from it. Not because the Java language is bad or the JVM is terrible or any of those other things. No, they're great. The problem is that the mindset of all the people that work on this stuff is just in, it's not ops friendly. It's not dev friendly. It's nobody friendly. I, I can see that to some degree. I think it's gotten, I definitely gotten better recently. Oh, I would have loved, I would love to be proven wrong on that. I would love to see proof of that because like, I'm a little bit out of the loop in the Java ecosystem, admittedly. Like my workplace is mostly Python, Ruby, PHP, and Go. I used to live very deeply in the Java ecosystem, and it was always a disappointment how how they handled things back then. I, I'm a big fan of Spring frameworks. I'm a big fan of a lot of the stuff around like that Red Hat's been doing in open, the Open JDK ecosystem, and also in the uh, Eclipse, the Eclipse mm-hmm. Foundation in particular. And like, there's tons of really great applications written on top of Java and, and it also frameworks on top, like being able to do data connection with Apache Camel. That's mm-hmm. underneath it's Java all day long. But the, up top of that, you have to write everything in Camel, which is different, but mm-hmm. it's... It's optimized for that workload. Yeah, exactly. And there's other things like Drools and OptiPlanner that are all written in Java that have done that are really great at what they do and it relies heavily on the java ecosystem and from what i can tell i'm not a contributor to those projects but what i can tell is they have a lot of benefits to being in the java ecosystem and that they would not have if they were not java yeah sure but i think that like the i think the kind of point i want to make here is that when you look at these toolings and things like that this is what like the mentality and the philosophy and, and like how you think about how things are going to work is a big part of the DevOps model to me. And so like when you see people, I see a lot of talk about, you know, Tecton and Argo and Ansible and Terraform and Packer and all these other things. Like, okay, these are all great tools and they all enable things, but how they make operations, how they make uh, DevOps operationally is in how you use them, not that they exist. Because in the previous episode, we talked about how I could argue all of these are dev tools, right? It's very easy to do that. But then I also, you know, at the tail end of it, I said, I could argue Git is an ops tool. And now I will give you like the the whole real, you know, the, the real spiel here is these tools are ops tools just as much as they're dev tools, because some of the benefits of using these things are very operationally friendly. So if your development team and your operations team are super disciplined on how they manage their change sets and put them into Git and then and roll them out, then you have very clean versioned history of your of your application, of your of your operational model. And if something goes wrong, a you can go git bisect, you can do git revert. I mean, you can do this in fancy UIs, but like the, the, the tools are all built in. And so that's the neat part is because you can encode your decision logic, your business decisions in the changes that you make. And, and that's, the, that's something that I think people underestimate a lot when it comes to, to, to these things. And that's, that's where I think Git is super valuable as an ops tool because you can encode business and operational decisions as part of the the actual changes. Yes. Yeah. And what what for example you can add in like the current what your current contracts are uh for the public cloud providers. Th- these are the costs for each instance and this is the cost for storage and optimize where you're deploying based off the needs of the business at that moment, which is critical in terms of keeping OPEX costs down, uh, especially when you're dealing with public cloud, because that's where spend for public cloud is. You know, in my, my space, like OPEX is, uh, is a naughty word. I mean, everywhere else, everyone loves OPEX, but in telco, they love CapEx, but you got, so you got to watch that. Well, the reason they love CapEx comes down to like how they actually operate their business, right? OPEX, 
OPEX and telco is defined by um, unexpected events. CAPEX in telco is defined by predictable events, whereas in most industries, it's flipped. That's why OPEX is such a naughty word in telco. And this tells you that I actually know a little bit about telco, and I shouldn't, but I do. <laughs> you know a lot about it. <laughs> Found out Neil wrote about it. Oh, yes, I, I, used, to, I used to do that. I have, a, I have a horrible feeling that that's going to circulate around a little bit more now because because <laughs> Brandon found out. I might put that in the show notes. So. Oh, no. <laughs> I'm not that embarrassed about it. It's, a, it's an important part of my life. Like that's, that's the part that taught me about business dynamics um, uh, in, in the macro space, probably more than anything else. I want to circle back on this business topic. One of the things I've, I've said, that, I think I said it last time, I said it, I've said it many times. Modern system administrator is an automation engineer. If you don't understand how to do automation, whether if that's writing scripts, Bash, Python, doesn't matter. Ansible, Chef, Puppet, doesn't matter. If you don't understand those things, you need to. Go do it. Go understand it because it applies to revenue generating systems, the new systems, everywhere. Being able to use uh, those those solutions, being able to take take that knowledge and version control it so you can track it, so you know what was executed and when is very important. And being able to flipping the mindset from being a system administrator to an automation developer or engineer, however you want to describe the role, puts you in the mindset of under wanting to understand the business logic so that you can adapt your automation to the business. That's what I personally think gets, even in some shops that have adopted DevOps, uh, people can't see me doing this push-pull thing but uh, with my hands, but Neil can. And you know, Dev wants to go one way, Ops wants to go the opposite way, even with DevOps adoption in some, you know, culture adoption in some form, there's still that tug of war. And I think if you change it and flip it so that system administrators, automation engineers understand the business better, understand requirements better, they start flowing and going in the same direction. Just keep that, you know, so they keep that operation. They still have all the operational knowledge. They're still valuable in that regard, but they need need to also understand business requirements as well as the the developers and i think that shift from being i'm a button pusher to i'm working with the development team because i'm doing i'm developing automation uh completely changes their mindsets i've seen it i what i can you can see it happen because you can see ops guys go from being button pushers to just typing in you know doing manual uh, changes, reading mops, and doing the ma- and manually going through their going through the mop, and then when they go actually go take that mop, read it, and then write the automation for it, and then they can change it more dynamically, faster, better, based on the needs of the business at the time. But yeah, like you're you're right. Like this is this is one of those things that is I think the long term trajectory for most businesses going through a DevOps transformation. But, uh, you know, you mentioned not pushing buttons, and I'm going to turn this around and make this a little bit more controversial. I think the long-term goal should be you're just pushing buttons. Because, and and hear, hear me out. So we started from pushing buttons, but pushing all the buttons individually, one by one, and getting all the things. But and then having to mentally manage that workflow as you push the buttons. Then you're going into this automation model where you're taking those button pushings and you're turning them into scripts and tools and workflows and and things like that. Once you've gotten all those things worked out, you turn around and turn them back into buttons that you push. But those buttons are not buttons where you have to think about all the details every time you press them. The button is a simple button. So like, for example, um, one of the things that's actually quite difficult for people to do is to produce golden images for their workflows. Like 
if you're if you're a business that's trying to do optimized usage of public cloud or private cloud resources, one thing you're probably not going to want to do is waste time running your kickstarts to or auto yast XMLs to then run the traditional Anaconda or Yast installation of your systems and then go down this horrible road of like, oh man, I'm waiting two hours and I'm downloading my packages from the interwebs and then spending like maybe a day waiting for all of my machines to spin up. No, you probably want those machines to be predefined in an infrastructure as code style manner in a way that you can maintain really easily. And that's where tools like Kiwi um, as part of the open build service or image builder. Um, I think it's also known as cockpit composer or something like that. Um, as part of the cockpit project, you can go through this, this model of like defining what your, what your infrastructure environment looks like and, and turn that into something that is repeatable and useful and then turn it into pushing a button to build it, ship it or extend it and then ship it and make it super easy for people to go onto your happy paths for making your infrastructure really sing. I actually think, yeah, it's probably a button. For me, it's changing some lines and probably some YAML. Kiwi <laughs> uses XML by default, so that, that so, makes me happier. Or, or, or some other fun markup language, whatever. Yeah, you make a change here, change there. Maybe it's a change in a different system that says the new image needs to be based on XYZ version of RHEL, SUSE, Ubuntu, Debian, whatever. And then after I hit get push, it does it. That's my goal. And my other goal is, is even, even simpler. Probably same, same vision is go into a self-service portal of some kind and I need the latest and greatest image. I hit order, press, and it, and it goes and builds it, deploys it. It's done. As a developer, I have the latest image of RHEL or the latest uh, UBI or my own custom container image, all deployed, done, ready to go, and I get an email with credentials. That's what I want. So I think the long-term goal of anybody doing DevOps and this is going to be super controversial and everyone's going to hate me for it. Your long-term goal should be click ops. Somebody should be able to click a button and get the right thing 100% of the time. And I, I'm saying this as someone who understands all the things. I actually don't want to. I want to be able to just click a button and just sit back a little bit and, and, and do the things and then just be done with my life. I'm that guy that uses the Horizon UI in OpenStack almost religiously because even though the CLI tools exist, I don't like using them. So one of the one of the goals that I actually helped a customer do is exactly that. They wanted to be able to easily, quickly deploy Linux, and all they wanted to do want, it was specifically for developers, and all they wanted the developers to do was click on the order form, put in which version of RHEL they wanted, which configuration they needed. So like, is it going to be a Python application, Java application? So it deployed the standard configuration for the, their enterprise applications. And then they press the order button. 20 minutes later, they had a new machine. And, at the, and that's, to me, that's the, that's click ops. Absolutely. No, that's, that's what I want to see. I want to, I want my long-term hope is that you know, super long-term, like super visionary kind of hope, is that we get to a world where we don't need people to understand all the abstractions, all the layers, all the tools underneath, and they can get the right thing done by just asking something to do what it wants, what they want, right? And at Datto, this is actually, um, this is a big part of how we do stuff. Like, so we have internal tools that are web apps that are literally portals that let people follow a form, fill in some values, click a button, and their environment is spun up. It's like the current environment setup is like, oh, uh, I think like 25 virtual machines and like some many odd containers and whatever. But like this is, we're doing it this way because it, it makes it easy for them to just get everything going and, and hit the ball rolling. 
and they can still so check the status of those things. They can look at the end. They can see whether they need to refresh it. It needs to be purged. Are they, you know, do they need to request credentials again? Do they need to reset? Is it like these, these all, the, all these things underneath it all is like five different systems that are being orchestrated, but do they have to care about it? No. Now, some developers want to do some enterprising automation stuff, which is fine, right? Like we also support that workflow where you want to do the infrastructure as code type of model for this stuff. Um, we have an API endpoint. There is a configure. There's a code service that people can use. They can define their things, run a script, be done with it. Like having those both of those models supported makes me personally really happy and makes me feel really like we're doing the right thing because it supports the people that can that work in either model in either world and they can still be successful and everyone comes away with it feeling good. This is just making my brain go. So I think I'm going to have to do a, a YouTube video on a couple of tools <laughs> to, to, to get to, to get to this. Yes. It's a little bit of code, maybe a couple hundred lines of Ruby. Maybe I, I can reduce it down to, to a handful of Ansible playbooks. I'll need to think about it. I mean, the idea isn't to avoid code. It's to make it so that code is only written once. No, nah, that, nah, that, that's what I'm getting at. Do a whole thing on how to get there. And I know how to do it very well with <laughs> one tool. Oh, man. I'm interested. I, I'm going to have to think about how I'm going to approach that and, uh, and get that out in the very near future at pseudo.show pseudo .show slash YouTube. Please subscribe. Thank you so much for joining us today. As always, your feedback is welcome. Head on over to pseudo.show slash discuss. If you'd like more of the pseudo show, you can find it over at pseudo.show, pseudo.show slash YouTube, and on social media at pseudo show podcast. You can catch more awesome content over our network partners, destinationlinux.network. You can support the show on Patreon at pseudo.show slash Patreon or sponsor us at pseudo.show slash sponsors. And of course, pseudo.show slash store. There will be links in the show notes. Neil, anywhere you'd like to send our listeners? Of course. You know, we've been talking a lot about how my experience and my environment at Datto has been. And if you're interested in maybe, you know, checking out Datto, you can go to our website at datto.com. And if you're interested in maybe coming to work with me, uh, we've got lots of positions open in dev, in ops, DevOps, SRE, all kinds of stuff. And, and even if it's a non-technical field, we have got a lot of positions open across the whole spectra. You can go to datto.com slash careers. Uh, I'll make sure Brandon puts those in the show notes. And of course, if you want to talk to me a bit, like I'm on Twitter and uh, as Detective Conan Kudo, D-E-T underscore Conan underscore Kudo on Twitter and on uh, Mastodon, I'm at Fostodon as at Conan underscore Kudo. And again, I'll make sure there are links in the show notes. And thank you for uh, giving me the opportunity to, to do this. Yeah, thank you, Neil, for coming on. I really appreciate it. And I will be having you back on here real soon, I'm sure. You can follow me on my social media at dbrandonjohnson or my website, open-tech.net, and new content at destinationlinux.network. Thank you for listening to the Pseudo Show, where business meets open source. Until next time.